give me immense pleasure to welcome to I, Mr. R. Gopal Krishnan, as, as you all know, is the director of Data Sons. Uh, he joined Data Sons in 1998, and prior to Data Sons, he was in Stan Lieber for 31 years. And a bit, a small background: he's uh, done his uh, physics in uh, Calcutta University, followed by an engineering degree in IIT. He's also the author, author of two books, uh, The Bonsai Manager and uh, When the Penny Drops, uh, Learning What Is Not Taught. And uh, this is also happens to be the topic for uh, today's seminar. So without wasting any further time, I'd like to invite uh, Why am I trying to get to that person? 
then it is a bit on poor mind. It matters a lot. If you are from a very poor tribal family and you are conscious of that, as distinct from a person who is from an urban, uh, you know, doom school or something, it makes a big difference to the mindset. So, and then I say you live in three different worlds as you go into your career. And you are always torn in the balance between intuition and rationality. You really think you are as rational as you are. You know, all of us think we are very rational. If I ask how many of you are irrational or emotional, even the women won't put up their hands. <laughs> right? But the truth is that we are completely intuitive. And we pretend to lead our life through rationality. Right? And then as you start your journey, this monster called ego gets you. This is not a Sri Sri Ravi Shankar talk. Why don't we come up in the front of this? And this is not a Sri Sri Ravi Shankar thing. But this ego manifests itself in three ways. It either enhances or depletes your learning ability. It either enhances or depletes your followership ability. And it enhances or depletes your leadership ability. So he can be a friend or a monster. Usually he turns out to be a bit of a monster. Occasionally he can be a friend. Declan? You want to say anything? I thought I was only supposed to stand here. That's why they taught me in college. Only the person was. So, out of this, so it's a. So, what I'm going to cover today is this. Obviously, I can't cover all of this. I normally camp in the campus for two days and so So, I just wanted to tell you that this is part of a fuller set. And uh, I enjoy sharing this because I get many perspectives from it. Now, one of the most common questions that so it has also been developed, if I have to say, out of the kind of question that people ask. And therefore, you want to know, you want to make the presentation relevant to them. So there are five topics in this. And I'll cover this in the second part. What is the three words in which you live in? And I'll come to that three words bit. But before I get to the three words bit, I just want to get some uh, introductory comment. How does this word penny? When the penny drops and how, how it works. Have you heard this term? When the penny drops? Yeah. Anybody can explain what it means actually? Money into the telephone. Right. So it, the, the origin is in uh, the old slot machines back in the 40s in the UK. When slot machines were being invented for the first time, and you put in a penny to go to the zoo or to get a telephone call through or to get a bus ticket. And very often, as it still happens in our country, the slot machine will not respond. <laughs> Upon which, in England, they would quietly walk away saying they lost a penny. <laughs> but in India, <laughs> some of the kicks would be administered to the gadget <laughs> until it responds. <laughs> right? Beat it up a bit, you know? Get a Sadarji friend if you're not strong enough. <laughs> and the penny would drop, and you say, ah, number like here. So if penny dropped, out of that. And it was used for the first time by this guy called Nigel Bolshev. He was an author of the book and he used this expression in the penny drops in 1951. The only people who understand this expression are people who have studied in England and who are English or Indians who are English-like, meaning they have been into an English school and a convent school. But otherwise nobody understands this. When the penny drops, it's not called. In fact, the Tamil version and the Hindi version of this book have come out and a lot of time was spent in figuring out how to name it. He said, that paisa gira. <laughs> it actually made no sense at all to anybody. And so a lot of research went in how to name it. What is the Tamil version, sir? Uh, if I remember right, it says Nijaman uh, Anubhavangar. Okay. Okay, Nijaman Anubhavangar. So, uh, that's the origin of this. Uh, expression. And it refers to the fact that indeed the human brain is a bit like a combination lock. Uh, in one of the other sessions in that first map I showed you, I talk about the brain and how it works and why some of the things that happen, happen. But uh, that's not the subject of today's lecture. If I gave you a combination lock, it's only three digits. This one has four. 
And then he said, I've forgotten the number, I want you to open this door. How would you go about it? Come on, you guys know what I am beat, I think. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do? Yes, let's say, it's popular, say, one, two, three, you know, just go on, do it a thousand times, yeah. and somewhere it will work, or a hundred times, right? See, you didn't have to come to I am to know this, you know, it's pretty straightforward. But suppose I gave you a lock, which is a hundred digit code, then you have a problem, right? Because you're not going to have the patience. To sit with 0, 0, 0, 0, 99 and you will spend your whole life doing that. But on top of that, I told you that every two hours, depending on the position of the sun and the moon, the combination lock score changes. <laughs> you won't even start. You just throw away the lock and go to buy a new lock, right? Now, the, this brain that you possess is exactly that. It's got a hundred digit code and every two hours it changes its code. So even the owner of the brain does not know exactly how it works. I think all of you are evidence of it. <coughs> it is only 3% of your body weight. How much of your energy does it consume? Any idea? 20%. 20%. 25. Who is that? Who said 20? Are you a doctor? No, I read it somewhere. You read it somewhere? <coughs> So, it's a hugely intensive, it's like the, uh, if you put your laptop, you know, it gets very hot underneath. This is a bit of that, 25% of the energy you consume. But it's only 3% of your body weight, 60, 70 kilos, it's probably a kilo or two in weight, but it consumes a lot of energy. <coughs> we all know that the brain never goes to sleep. And anyway, that's a separate subject, I won't go into it. And the reason I talk about the brain is, a lot of, how we see life and our journey and our career and our dilemma come out of this brain. And management students in particular, and this is not a special praise for management students or a special criticism of management students. Since I'm in a management college, if I went to a dental college, I'll say the same thing about dentists. So, you know, please don't become parochial about uh, the word management. Uh, human beings, you say. Um, we are prone to thinking that proximity equals knowledge. I've been married to this woman for the last 30 years. I know her very well. Bullshit. <laughs> Anybody who's been married 30 years and has managed to stay married <laughs> doesn't know his wife. We have to ask the wife whether the husband knows her and she will tell you promptly, Avara, you know, she's a gone case. And converse. <laughs> If you work in a company for 30 years, you think you know everything about that company. If you work in the steel industry or the automotive industry or the software industry, so it is a natural connection in our brain to assume that long exposure and so on and familiarity makes you know. But here is a good example of something to which you have the most intimate exposure and you don't know what's in it. So, it's a very prized possession which is mysterious. And I wanted to just make that point. And I want to go to the subject of learning because this is the this is the hardware you require to do any learning. And obviously, without a brain, <laughs> you don't learn any. You don't need me to prove that to you. Okay. So, how does learning happen? Now, this is the work of uh, academics. So, I will not pretend. I'm not going to spend a lot of time giving talks on this. There will be professors of behavioral science who will agree or disagree, but I just want to create a model so that as we go along, we have something to refer to. The most important thing is learning happens out of concrete experience, out of doing. This enormous emphasis in management about strategy worries the hell out of me. Because you've got all these high kilowatt drain boxes coming out of the institutes of management, Harvard, Wharton, thinking that Business is all about strategy. Business is about doing. I think this comes particularly with, uh, this is my view. People may disagree, but I, I don't intend to offend anybody, but I don't mind being slightly like provocative. I think it comes out of the deep rooted sense in our head of having a hierarchy of what are good tasks and bad tasks. And the Brahmin is supposed to be the brain box, right? And so the Brahminical work, where thinking, cogitating, meditating, those are all high class. 
So being the chief strategy officer, being personal assistant to somebody, doing investment banking and working out structures, doing IT work, this appeals to us culturally. And then as you come down in that, working with your hands occupies section 3, right? And doing menial work is section 4. So I think there's a natural pre-programmed unwitting admiration amongst management people all over the world to do strategy work and thinking work. And probably Indians a bit more so. But I want to leave you with the message that you don't learn anything that way. Yes, you learn to think. If that's all you want to be, that's fine. But that doesn't make you a manager or a leader. If you want to be a high quality professor, you want to be uh, an academic, get a Nobel Prize, that's fine. Because that's your profession. But I'm talking now of managers in the real world. And out of your experiences, you have a number of observations on which you reflect. What worked, what didn't. This happens automatically. I don't think you sit down and necessarily meditate. But it happens automatically. I tried to recruit this person. I did everything possible to check that he's a good, balanced, experienced person. He joined. But after six months, it's not working out. He turns out to be arrogant or he puts off people. What did I do wrong in the recruitment? You know, this naturally happens to you. And so this is the second very important railway station you cross in this journey of learning. I actually bring it to practice every morning. And it's very hard. And I, I, I have no exemplar of it today. But I sit down and I try to reflect on all the experiences of meetings yesterday. What happened in that meeting? What did Professor Prasad tell me? Was there an inflection in his voice? Was he trying to give me a signal? And I find it very difficult to remember the detail of what happened yesterday. The broad message you remember. But to be able to reflect on it because the human brain moves. We are not trained unless you are Sri Sri Ravi Shankar to control your mind. And none of you quite looks like Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. <laughs> not yet. Maybe in future you might become. So this is a very important part of learning. Out of that learning, you arrive at some hypothesis, abstract, uh, what is the word here? Conceptual, that's an academic word, abstract. <coughs> you, you start to make a hypothesis. So you start to develop a word. You know, generalizations. All Punjabis are loud and, uh, you know, gregarious. All Tamils are vegetarian and sitting quietly. <laughs> you know, all Bengalis are uh, fighting all the time, uh, creating controversy. You know? And then you will get into argument by saying, you know, <coughs> look at X or Y or Z. We, we tend to create models in our mind. And of course, we create different models because we've had different uh, experiences. And then we experiment and then go through the cycle again and again. So this uh, chart, which, uh, to which I claim no originality, I found it was very helpful for me as a practical manager to emphasize the point about concrete experience. And I worry a lot. In data, we used to recruit TAS officers. And until 2002, they were all very elite guys. Right? When I say elite, the TAS goes back 40, 50 years. In those days, there was no higher ed, there was no management study. So in the initial years, if he came back from Oxford, Cambridge, then MA in economics or English literature or anthropology and he spoke English well to hire the guy. We recruited four or five in a year, which is enough for the business frankly in the 50s and the 60s. And he was given a lot of brain work to do. And what that meant was he became an executive assistant to one of the directors. And uh, it became fashionable in the TF that that's the aspired job. As soon as you did some little bit of training, you went and became an executive assistant. Now it's not that you don't learn anything by being an executive assistant. But for a short time that's okay because you do learn a few things. But that cannot be the way. People have spent 10 years, 15 years being executive assistant to director or director. And that doesn't give you, that uh, actually causes you to miss this. Now I wouldn't want you to go away with the impression that brain has no role. That just doing mechanically, but then you might as well be a factory leader. It's the ability to combine the two into learning that makes you different. So I do want to say a little bit about this box. 
these last two points <coughs> yes. uh, you think that this is all about continuously doing especially young people because you are prone to continuously doing you know i can't sit my nephews come home and say the mama they are on blackberry he then take out the mobile phone and keep it there then he put his ipad over here and he will never look me in the eye because he's constantly watching which one is the tv <laughs> right? And he oh, sorry, Mama, just one minute. No, 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 no. And then the other one, then he will make some message. The world has become shorter. The number of nanoseconds available has become limited. And I'm drawing this to your notice because this may actually be the casual. My grandfather in the village in Tanjavur was a very different thing. He would sit outside the house on his thin and the whole world will be passing by and he would have conversations. All your grandfathers did the same thing. But you guys are unlikely to ever do that. You probably never even go to the village. But well, the village won't be what it was. So the life has changed. So I do want to say that don't give me the impression that you are likely to fall into the trap if you take the way the world is structured and is going to turn out in the future. And if you take my message too literally, then you are just constantly doing things. And then you and guys who come to me and say, sir, I've been in the foundry for 20 years, why aren't you making me the general manager? You've been the same thing. What have you learned out of it? I've got 20 years experience. There are government bureaucrats who sit in Delhi and have 20 years experience I've been in this ministry. What have you been doing? Pushing paper. What did you learn out of it? And some of them have, obviously, but some of them don't. So, this is uh, from my first book in the Bangla book. You have to be deeply immersed if you're going to learn, you must be deeply immersed there. All of you might have seen the finals three days ago between Djokovic and uh, Nadal. <laughs> now, five hours, 53 minutes, he kept there. If you're not deeply immersed in tennis, physically fit, and you don't understand that five hours, 53 minutes. If you're not deeply immersed in management, uh, you won't have come here. But something happens to people when they finish with IIF. Because then, like a juvenile, they throw away all their books and they think there's nothing more to learn. I finished my MBA from IIM or PG, DBM or some such telecom sounding for a degree that are conferred by these institutes. PG, EBG, X. The truth is that your learning has beginning only the day you graduate. And I do state with great fervor that immersion in a trade or a subject means it's constantly with you, you're immersed, that's what it means. And so people who say, I don't go to seminars, I don't read magazines, I don't read books, and yeah, my company sent me for some course in IIM, I just went, are missing out something. I know that a lot of it is wasteful, a lot of stuff is wasteful, but every creative thing God has created is wasteful. The human reproduction system, the botanical reproduction system, they are all wasteful. To get one success, you have to have so many experiments <laughs> in biology, in botany, you see this in nature all the time. And that happens in management learning as well. It's not different. So, it is very, very important to be deeply immersed. And if I, at the risk of appearing to preach to you, which I try not to do, I would urge you that please remember what you've learned here is irrelevant for your future. I mean, it's a useful thing. It's like you must have clothes, you must have a suitcase, but for God's sake, you are being taught here to think. And if you suspend that capability, then whatever they taught you is useless. I have a great story of B.K. Nehru, who was the cousin of Jawaharlal Nehru, in case you are, he used to be the ICS in the old days. And in the 1930s, he went to London School of Economics to study. And uh, who taught him? Professor Harold Lasky. Now, if you know, all must have heard of Harold Lasky, the great uh, economist, uh, very strong, left-leaning. And in those days, London School of Economics was a hotbed of socialistic thinking, which influenced in turn Nehru's and gave us the kind of government that we also set up right after the Second World War, or after independence. So Harold Lasky taught B.K. Nehru. Now, you have to be a very privileged, upper-class, Ilahabadi, to go to London to study in London School of Economics, which he came out of. He came back, he joined the ICS. After 20 years or 15 years, back in the early 50s or something, 
and they want to honor him as a distinguished alumnus. So he went back, and that by this time, also Lasky was quite old. And after the ceremony was over, Lasky said, "Come on, bridge, let's go for a walk." So they were walking in the bonds of the London School of Economics, and very hesitantly, uh, middle-aging BKNL said, "Sir, I have to tell you one thing. I really admire your economics classes, college." And uh, I took it to heart. I studied them. I went back to India, and I was posted in the districts in Azamgarh and Tiruvallur. Yeah, none of your theories works in reality. <laughs> I've had to reinvent the whole thing, sir, all over again. I'm sorry to tell you that whatever you taught me doesn't work. And you can have that piece of reply. He said, "Ah, bridge. That's so interesting. I am delighted with what you say, because what I was trying was not to teach you economics. I was trying to teach you to think." The fact that you thought about it and come to a different conclusion gladdens me because that's the heart of academics. There is only a shallow truth and a deep truth. And as a physicist, Neil Bohr said, science attacks the deep truths because those are not immutable. And that's the I mean, anybody who is a serious academic will tell you that challenging the existing thing is what keeps him going, not the salary or other things. Correct? So this immersion is a very very important part. The second is openness. If you want to challenge something, your mind has to be open. And I was trying to illustrate to you that there is an automatic button in our head which closes the mind. We tend to jump to conclusions. General V K Singh's date of birth is 1950 or 51. How the hell does it matter to this country? Some crazy general, some crazy adjutant. The whole bloody S R K slapped Farah Khan's. Whatever. <laughs> How can this be on the front page of a newspaper which calls itself the largest circulated and read daily in the world? Farah Khan S R K. So this is not openness. This is madness. But openness means we should not develop those kinds of predisposition. And then I refer to contemplation and reflection. And there is a difference between the two. They look similar. Contemplation is the act of focusing on the subject at hand. So I tell you, what do you see? I am holding a bottle. What is there in the bottle? Ah, oh, it's got a blue band around it, and it's a mineral water. When Dronacharya, who was a teacher of Arjuna in archery, said to Arjuna, "My dear boy, pick up your bow and arrow and look at that tree." Tell me, what do you see? He said, I see a tree. And he says, What do you see on the tree? He said, On the, one of the branches, I see a bird. He said, What do you see in the bird? He said, I just see that it's got two eyes. He said, Look further. He said, Now I can see only one eye. Then he says, Look further. He said, I can see only the pupil of the eye. He says, Now release the arrow. That's how he trained in archery. How to focus on the object. And most of us have a tra training which encourages us to do this. Don't answer it, dear Arjuna. Your teachers have done it. Your parents have done it. We all do the same thing. And therefore, contemplation is to consider the problem that you face, the object of uh, discussion. You want to come here? Anybody? You're welcome. And that is the context where Arjuna began when. Dronacharya asked him. He said, "I see the blue skies. I see a lot of green trees, uh, green grass. I see trees around me. So, if you want to solve in any problem, and in our case, we are talking about business problem, you have to understand the problem and its context. So, when you do case studies, I have often found, and I am exaggerating a little bit, just to make it a little light-hearted. You tear apart that poor CEO." All a dumbo. <laughs> Couldn't he figure out that this is the wrong time to take on the union? He should have followed a four-point program. He should have done this, that, 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 that. And the professor has also been trained to say yes. What else? What else? <laughs> <laughs> Go away with an idea that Jack Welch's model is good or bad, 
or uh, somebody else's model is good or bad. And you get all these books, you know, what Gandhiji teaches management, <laughs> or what uh, Hitler can teach management. And we all spend money and buy those books. But we tend to look at problems without looking at their context. And each context is different. I say management is like a performing art, it's like a game of cricket, it's like Bhardhanaji. No two days are the same. You talk to Adhani Melavalli, no two dancers. He may be doing the same dance. You may think you've seen that dance before. But to her, the context is different. This audience in the Madras Music Academy, that audience in Los Angeles, they're different. The dance may be the same. You ask any cricketer, his innings is never the same. Otherwise, Sachin Tendulkar got his 100. For a chat, he doesn't get it. But the context is different. So I want to make that distinction that in the learning, you have to go through the cycle. And that's how uh, new wisdom downs on you. And that's how management learning takes place. And there's a lot of difference in the perspectives of people in a company. I would like to use this little picture. Imagine this is a train. And uh, you have just joined the training, okay? So I'm afraid you get seat number 16 Z in the last movie. But where do you think your chairman or managing director is sitting? Probably somewhere there. And your bosses are somewhere. So think of this like an organogram. And imagine that this train is going to get into Uti, starting from Metropolitan, or from Kalka to Simla. Naturally, the train goes up and down and it turns various corners. The scenario that this guy is seeing is very different from what this guy is seeing. But you are on the same train. So you can have a situation where Manmohan Singh and Pranam Mukherjee think they are solving the nation's problems. <laughs> and the guys sitting here are saying, my guys are doing nothing at all. <laughs> and when you join a company, the larger the company, the more likely that there are so many bogies here, you just don't know what he is seeing. So the company is in trouble. If you talk to Vijay Malia's company, <laughs> since I'm in Bangalore, he may think the problem is almost solved, keep frying Kingfisher. But the guy sitting here says, bloody hell, I don't know this plane will land. I don't know the fuel has been paid for. I don't know if I've been hijacked. Both of them may be wrong. That doesn't matter. But they are seeing very different things. And so what happens in a company is that the senior leadership is constantly communicating to their employees. They all think they have open communication. From being unaware, the employees gradually become aware. We have a problem of cash. Okay? And so everybody cut costs. And this fellow is saying it, but this guy can't see why he's saying all that. By the time this guy gets here, this fellow has gone here. And so they are seeing different things. Finally, what happens to this guy is from uninformed pessimism, he goes into informed optimism. He goes through the cycle, he then understands what's the problem, and then he starts a debate. It is like Lokpal Bill. Just think of what happened to Lokpal Bill. One year ago at this time, most of us didn't know that such a thing existed. Unless you were in politics or Lok Sabha or something, and most of us, Lokpal Bill was something that came to the papers. Now many of us know that it's been on for 44 years. It's tried to get through parliament 12 times. Because the whole thing has changed. Because of the intensity of communication. So we think we have comprehended. And there is a lot of debate. Every guy has an opinion on the Lok Pal Bill. It is not only Kiran Bethi and uh, Kedriwal and Anna Hazare who have an opinion. You and I have an opinion. A little bit of C2H5OH gives us our opinion great strength. <laughs> <laughs> the ability of alcohol to focus the brain and the tongue and to unleash creativity is enormous. <laughs> and when the debate happens, somebody has to convince somebody. So by the time the action begins in the company, I remember when I joined as a young trainee in Hindustan Deva, and we were all bachelors in those days, and uh, the bosses were on the fifth floor, and we had nothing to do uh, on Saturday. So we would come to the office, and then we'd go for some adda and uh, some coffee or lunch or whatever. And we would say, what happened in the last one week or two weeks? Somebody would say, I'm a brand manager for Life Boys. Somebody would say, I'm the accounts department. But we came to the same conclusion, irrespective of what the subject was, that these idiots up on the fifth floor don't have a clue what's happening in the company. 
it just didn't matter what the subject was. <laughs> recruitment system, training of management trainees, telling them their career path, the way the books of accounts are kept, how we did a market segmentation for a brand, how the factory produced the soap. It didn't matter what the subject was. It came back to this. If only these pretty guys would get out of the way, meaning, you know, <laughs> making the way for us, uh, then we'd be all right. And this is a syndrome that happens. These guys always tend to think these guys are idiots. Until they get there. <laughs> 20 years later, I was sitting on the fifth floor. And I went quietly to the MLA hostel downstairs for a quick idli at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon because I had to work a bit late. And I was sitting behind a pillar. So I could not be seen. And there were some young fellows, trainees. And they said, Sala, ye company me ye got what I I said, bloody hell. I couldn't, if I appeared in front of them, they'd all say, sorry, sorry, sorry. But I said, the world has changed. Now I am the idiot. So, I find this chart very good to say, perspective, this is what I mean by context. Your context changes. When I was young, I said, Hindustan, you know, there's no management development system. It's all very bullshit career path here. 20 years later, I was saying, there is a damn good system. But the guy down there never believed me. I don't think they still believe. I've never met any company, I've met many companies by now, where young people believe there is something like a career development system. They are all convinced that some idiots out there are screwing it up. Until they get there and they get their chance to screw it up. <laughs> and so this cycle continues. And therefore this becomes a very important part of your mindset and your context. And what is the CEO trying to do in the company? <coughs> Because of where he's sitting, he says this is the present rate of change in the company. He's like a helicopter or a plane pilot. And he says the external environment, all these things are happening. Changing, blah, 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 competition, market, world economy, Greece, Portugal, blah, blah. So he says I cannot keep flying the plane the same way because I'm heading for a crash. So he has to take advanced action and he starts to plan a transformation. But you are sitting at the back of the plane, commenting that what an idiot, what a lousy pilot. And uh, his challenge really is he has to take the plane just over. If he changes the trajectory too much, then people will say, we can't handle this amount of change. And if he takes it too little, they will crash it anyway. Look at Mamta Banerjee's challenge in Bengal. She did the easy part. She fought with the CPM, she led Dharna, she did all this mumbo jumbo that she did. But now she is on her shoe. She's got to do something. I'm not saying she won't do it. Uh, that's not the subject of our discussion. But she has to make. Now she say, I will not let you follow go on strike. Now imagine in Bengal telling people to go on strike. <laughs> Come on, I was born and raised in Bengal. It's a fundamental right. It's a constitution. You can get away in Karnataka, in, in, but Kerala and Bengal are fundamental right. <laughs> How can a chief minister get up and say that you can't strike? So, and, and, and this is going on uh, in many parts of the country, it happens in your company. And so the dissonance between, just like from one generation to the next generation in a family, there are adaptive differences. In an organization also it happens. So when you join your company after you finish from here, you come here because you are convinced that the leadership of your last company was idiotic. That some new enlightenment will come to you through EPGCX, which will enable you to go to a new company where life will be different. It could be different. It is a bit cynical to suggest it can't be different. But the same idiots will come in a different form. And you will become that idiot one of these days. Or you will be perceived that way. And that's the point I want to make. Because this is the challenge. You are seeing different, different scenes. And so I ask myself, when you go on your career, is your learning constant? Is it like going from class 1 to class 2, class 3, class 4, learn geography, history, mathematics, Hindi? No. What are the experiences and how do they shape you? So when you start your career, imagine this is the ocean, you are standing in the Madras Marina Beach. When you start your career, you are given known problems with known solutions. You are in this shallow area. Somebody says, you go and be the branch manager of the Mailapur branch and get me more accounts if you are in banking or you sell 
100 tons per month of soap in Tamil Nadu or whatever. You're given some resources that report to you and you're asked to go out. You're not going to face a problem in the mankind has not seen before. Some customer who did not pay, some distributor who has to be changed, some motivation, some new scheme has to be devised. Known problems, known solutions, early career. And during this time, you are judged by your boss whether you are efficiently deploying the resources given to you. I have given him five salesmen. Has he covered Tamil Nadu as well as the previous Tamil Nadu manager? Okay? Pretty straightforward. And then somewhere, you go into the second part of the ocean, a little deeper ocean. The currents are a bit stronger. And the third part, and I'm not going to go into each one because your imagination will tell you what they are. You start to see problems which are less known or which are more unknown and the solutions are also more unknown. So, you become the head of the Delhi branch. You now have a thousand people working for you. 200 in the factory, 200 in the sales, 100 in accounts, whatever, whatever. But there are some guys who are very uncooperative. There's one section which came through an M&A or something which is not focused. How do you solve that problem? So if you take Dr. Manmohan Singh, it was very easy when he was Secretary, Economic Advisor to Finance Ministry, Governor of the Reserve Bank, Prime Minister, he's sitting, <laughs> unknown problems, unknown solutions. So he gets up every morning and says, how do you solve a problem like Mamata? <laughs> like in the movie. Uh, and you are dealing in a completely deep part of the ocean where you are dealing with unknown problems, unknown solutions. So you are sitting at the top end of a Tata company or Infosys or any other company. What will happen in the Eurozone? You know, will <coughs> Greece collapse? Will Portugal collapse? What will happen to the currency? What will you do to your receivables? What will you do to your cash requirements? You are dealing with unknown problems. Then of course, there are ranges and ranges of that. If you are sitting as the CEO of Tata Chemicals, it's one level. If you are sitting in the job of Ratan Tata, it's a bigger level. If you are sitting in the job of a Prime Minister, it's an even bigger level. So your journey is to move people in the organization from solving known known problems to unknown unknown problems. And that is what your leadership has to be tuned to. Your learning has to be tuned to that. That is why that Nimok course cycle and reflection comes. Because what got you there will not get you there. That's very important because we tend to repeat what we did last time and hope that it works, but it doesn't anymore. It is just like your kid. Nobody's, some of you have children or some of you will shortly have children as the case may be. Uh, and some of you have been, all of you have been children. Uh, you can't treat your five-year-old child the same way as when the child is 15. Certainly not the same way when the child is 30. To you it's still a child, but you change automatically and that happens. And therefore, the way you are judged by your bosses is from the early stages where they say, can you efficiently deploy resources? The second stage, they say, can you effect effectively persuade people to cooperate with you and to deliver results? The accounts department is a bloody nuisance, you know, but they are there. Unless they pass the voucher, something else will not happen. And likewise, the production department. And then you go to the next stage, when you are up here, when you have to network and persuade outsiders. So I have to go to the government and convince a joint secretary that some raw materials, some electricity supply has to be increased, some pricing is wrong, import duty has to be changed. He doesn't even owe you anything for this way. And finally, when I get into the real leadership positions, I have to learn about myself. It is amazing. You start to learn about yourself only after you are 50. For some strange reason, up to the age of about 50, 50 I am using metaphorically, not literally. Swami Vivekananda got it much earlier. But most of us, even in our dreams, don't think we are in that league. So I am assuming you are all common people. Suddenly we, we call it midlife crisis, some dhaka happened, and then we start to reassess, and then we start to become self aware and it is this transformation that we are constantly dealing with. And so I have, I got many pictures to show the same thing. But the point I want to make is pretty simple. Your career development plan has to be made by you, not by that idiot on the fifth floor. 
and you have to figure out what is it you need to think about. And you therefore move from managing tasks to managing relationships to managing thought to actually converting into visions and finally to self awareness. Because in that journey I showed you, your own ego is your enemy, is also your friend. And it is that that you have to deal with. And the kind of things you are judged by by your bosses, when you are here, he says, can you deliver the sales in Tamil Nadu? Are you an accomplishing executive? There is very little for being an authentic leader. Who gives a damn? Some 28 year old guy is a head of Tamil Nadu sales. You see, authentic. Authentic meaning, what do people think of you? Do they, can they trust you? Can they follow you? But by the time you get here, authenticity is a very large part. So you are chief of the army staff or the navy. <coughs> it's a jump. Well, the guys jump. They got to believe you're authentic. They are not taking whether he can deliver sales in uh, national sales. I mean, it's taken for granted that the system will do that. So the nature of skills that you require are changing dramatically. And the only thing that helps you to reset your meter is your own sense of how that journey goes. <coughs> So I want to now get to these three words. How we do it for time? When did we start? And when are you supposed to finish? About 15 minutes more? Um, you bet. I can stop here, frankly. I can go on and on. I've got lots of charts. But do you want to interact with it? Because I think I'm talking too much. Does exactly mean agreeable manager? An agreeable manager is a guy, as they say, the calm kara leta hai. You know, you sometimes have to be tough. And Limited the ability to damage, to do damage or something like that. No, I said <coughs> which, which, which? <laughs> ability to limit damage or limit the one before? Learn to stay late in your career. Because you may be called managing director, but actually people regard you as the damaging director. <laughs> you know, you get egoistic. You start thinking that you run the world. And then you start falling into all sorts of traps, which is the stuff that I would cover if there was time. So, I, but that's what I meant by saying self-awareness. I don't want to be judgmental about public figures, but since we are sitting in a classroom, each of you have an opinion, so I don't want to get into that. But why would a guy who become chief of the army staff four months before his retirement <laughs> have a public discussion on his date of birth? Who the hell gives a damn other than his mother, who's also gone? Now, you can say the matter of honor and principle. So, I'd like to disagree here. No, no. I'm not getting into that debate. Because you just mentioned the army last night. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Just to you said that you, know, you expect the admiral's order or the chief of army staff's order to be taken, you know, that man should jump. Similarly, that's what the chief is questioning now. He's trying to say that you are making me feel like a liar in front of my command. And he's not one. Incidentally, his predecessor, he might be an ex army officer. But I have no qualms in saying that the, the, his predecessor was by far one of the most corrupt officers. And okay. fortunately we have a general who is cleaning up the system. I don't think he deserves to be treated like this. Fair enough. I will accept your opinion. I am not here to defend or um, uh, criticize the general. But what I am saying is does it matter to the country? It doesn't. It matters at all, not at all. And if his predecessor could have been a liar, why should I believe that he is not a liar? His command is to... Hey, if I look at it from the point of view of plain Joe, I am saying this is not a matter, you know, it's like SRK slapping whoever he slapped. Is it a matter of national? In the film world, it may be a very big event. And as I said, I am not trying to prove that uh, he's right or wrong. I understand there are strong views on both sides and we can live with that. So but can, you, can you talk on that other thing, what you, what you mentioned, that the three things which you wanted to take it up? Right. We can, I think maybe the CCL, which stands for the Center for Creative Leadership in North Carolina, they started to do a research. What makes leaders learn? How do they learn? And I, to the best of my knowledge, that's one of the most uh, important trade they think. They interviewed 191 executives and they asked only two questions. What happened to you and what did you learn? Now what happened to you doesn't have to be something of a huge uh, importance. It can be, I saw a car accident, I saw a child crushed under my eyes, that affects you. How it affected a business career, we don't know. I saw poverty, that affected me. 
I had a traumatic or a very good experience. What happened? What did you learn? That they, after 25 years, they came to us in TMTC and said, would you, because we find India and China are now emerging economies. So Indian managers learn differently from American managers. And that's how uh, we did this research. And then TMTC is bringing out a book on this shortly. Uh, they devised what they call the three worlds framework. And these are some of the lessons they said. That you need to learn some lesson that nobody teaches you. This is the point I was making all this time. And you learn by these lessons by reflecting on your own experiences. We've covered all these, so I'm not going to go into each of these. The two people who go through the same experience come to very different lessons. They don't always have the same answer. <coughs> this is that combination of it. When you get your aha feeling. That you learn by integrating your personal experiences, your motivation and your learning style. And you learn through experiences in your inner world, world and there are three worlds. The inner world, the world of relationships, and the world of doing things. So what are these three worlds? What do you learn in these three worlds? First thing I want you to notice, they are all roughly equal. Out of 100 units of learning, they are all three seem to contribute equally. The inner world is about you. Who am I? That, that module you saw in the first job. What is your level of confidence? What is your level of self-awareness? What are your life goals? What is your belief about honor, humanity, kindness? You know, very you say, we all are programmed and wired differently. In the second world, everybody has to get something done to be meaningful. So the world of meaningful is done. You said, what does agreeable mean? You, no point in accomplishing without being agreeable. You know, very soon somebody will try to trick you. So, um, the world of how you get things done. The third is the world of people. The importance of relationships in getting work done in a company. I'll tell you, when you get to the senior levels, you'll be like a guy who doesn't know his parachute will open. You don't know if the audit departments control the work. You have to go and take a decision to do an M&A, to integrate, to buy another company. And you get that empty feeling in your stomach. And you rely completely on people. And various aspects of this world, and I'm very happy to give a copy of this uh, research with uh, it's on the DMTC website, but if you want, I can send it to you. If you wish to read it, it's a small manual, it's not a fact. But coming to what is different about Indian management, we found something that is quite interesting. That uh, in the US, people leave the house at 18, and uh, they have learned to be independent. It will be very odd if a child is staying at the age of 21 with his parents. In India, it's the other way around. If my daughter goes to stay, in a flat uh, down the road, people say, oh, everybody will stay there. Even though his daughter is 25, she's going to stay alone. So we give independence in our social structure less readily. And people take independence less readily. And so that gave us the idea, and you may say, did you have to do all the research to find that idea? The sooner you put young people into position, if they falter, they falter. They will learn out of that also. Give them the responsibility to go and do it, rather than hand-holding them step by step and trying to grow them. So for example, the guy who came to work with me six years ago, he developed an idea, a project. And we said, now you go, don't go to one of the standard jobs, you know, being branch manager, sales manager, the usual hierarchy. Go and make your project happen, build us a thousand crore business. He is allowed to be an entrepreneur within a structured place like Tata. And he's having a whale of a time, which means he's getting a lot of frustration. <laughs> <laughs> Things don't happen, the pretty PowerPoint charts are not, you know, out in the marketplace and uh, retailers and distributors are understanding it the same way. Competitors are virtually from the side. <laughs> and he comes periodically and says, sir, you know, this, uh, I say, okay, but that's how you got to learn. My second assistant came and he came with this great idea that, India needs more pulses. I'm telling you very ordinary business things, you know, they are not rocket science. Now today he is going and he is running a whole pulse business. He paid only 50 crores now. But frankly, if I am 30 and I am given a 50 crore business to develop into a thousand crore business, I think it's quite nice. And I have to learn all these things as I go along. So that's the point about the three words. And then uh, the other charts go into what prevents you from being self-aware. <coughs> what are explicit and implicit lessons and so on and so forth. 
I've got plenty of charts more, but I'm mindful of it. Can you open up two questions about yeah. last time? If anybody wants to ask, it could be on this or anything else, by the way. You don't have to limit it. Any kind of a person, you know, any, any organization when they recruit and they look for a relevant experience and everything. You mentioned that experience really, uh, uh, in the sense, a new person can be molded into uh, the way what we wanted is also. So, how does that, you know, I'm, in the sense, it looks like a contradictory thing. You have to repeat, I have to run. The experience looks like, you know, it's a uh, value or uh, it's a, it's a, uh, or is it just a negative factor? No. Um I hope I'm answering your question, but I've understood it in a certain way. If I'm not, Please put I'm also not putting it in the right way. Yeah. We tend to think of experience as number of years of familiarity. Mm -hmm. So we say, I want to recruit a North America manager in software. So has he got 10 years software experience? Mm -hmm. And then we'll ask him questions on software and customers and coding and be hired. But don't, that's called domain knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's only one dimension of experience. There are three other dimensions of experience. One dimension is, have you been in a single industry all your life? Uh, if you haven't had exposure elsewhere, it is not that you are a bad fellow. It's just that you have had a different kind of experience. You may have a choice between two equally bright people. He has worked five years in software, five years in automotive. He has worked ten years in software. One might make a choice. He might have never worked in software, but he shows a high degree of learning ability. If I'm sitting on the interview panel, I will see all of you. And maybe I'll select him. And you may walk away saying he doesn't have experience in domain. Experience is not equal to domain knowledge. Mm -hmm. Domain is one. So working in multiple domains, working in multiple geographies. You know, I'm, when I was in Unilever, we used to say, when we are very young, we say, I live in my own world and I'm comfortable in my world. Then when you start your journey into the ocean, you say, I am aware that there are other worlds. I like to go to the other world, but I like to come back to my world. People who say, I must go back to Chennai or Kolkata or Punjab or wherever they go. Then there comes the third world. And they say, I am aware there are many worlds. I enjoy going there and working and I am equally comfortable there. But there comes the fourth world. When you say, I don't care where I am. I am able to integrate very different ideas together. Not everybody can live in these four worlds together simultaneously. And that is what constitutes experience. So if I look at my children, for example, they grew up in Bombay, they speak Tamil at home, but they speak Hindi, they speak Marathi, they studied in an international school, they went to America to study, and they are very comfortable, you know, yeah. traveling around the world, they learn Spanish. They are very different children from what I must have been and what my father must have been. And that's what I meant when I say experience. It is not a bad thing that you've been in one place or two places or five places. But it tells you the areas for you to be able to learn and focus. That's the point. So think of experience like a petals of a flower. There are multiple petals on the flower. Like a bee, have you sat on each of those petals for some time? If you want to, that is. Huh? If you're very focused, if you want to be a cricketer, then don't go around playing golf and football. Correct. 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 Be focused. But if you want to be the director of a sports institution, then maybe you want to go to what else? Sir, uh, to be at the helm of uh, Tata Group. So your colleagues would have joined and not many of them would have reached the heights you have reached. So my question is, uh, is this career progression contingent upon the kind of career choices you make? And so I want to get insight for myself that how dependent is it on what kind of career moves you make to uh, reach to a level that you go? You want my... Uh, honest answer or do you want honest? <laughs> <Butter. laughs> I am answer. Hey, honest, 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 huh? honest. <laughs> I did not plan my career. If anything good happened to me, there is a large element of luck in it. When I think back, just some, I got some bus. I didn't know the next bus would not come. It just happened to come. And I have one chart which I must show you. Since you asked the question, uh, let me see which chart number I can. Okay, I am answer. So can you get me to chart number 17? There are oh, 16, 16. Next so we, we learn the art of verbosity and complexity and somehow convince ourselves that if we don't use those tools of verbosity and complexity, we will not be taken seriously. In management world in particular, this is very strong. 
I'm going to show you five statements made by global CEOs. You recognize their names. They are very talented, good people. I'm not looking fun at them. I am also guilty. That's why I asked you, do you want the uh, real answer? And I said, as simple as that. These fellows get the awards for the highest management board. They beat all hands, hands down. Alan Mulali, this is what he said. Going forward, we are focused on aggressively managing short-term challenges and opportunities. And we remain committed to delivering our mid-decade plan and serving a growing number of customers. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> I mean, you remove this name and put one more on saying, you put the CEO of any company, you can say that. Huh? Does it mean anything? And yet, if you read that with his mugshot, <laughs> right? John Chambers, Cisco. We will accelerate our leadership across our five priorities and compete to win in our core. What the hell does that mean? Everybody's trying to do the same thing. Huh? What is distinctive about it? But these were quoted to analysts in press statements and then they get repeated. And so it goes on. <laughs> Look at this guy, senior partner. Huh? The challenge to re-aggregate the big picture while throwing my arms around as much of the density of complexities as possible, <laughs> distilling them down to their most basic constituents and plugging them back into the picture. He <laughs> 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 should get a very portrait from my head. <laughs> now, we all do this all the time. So when I refer to how did you learn, my honest, simple answer is we tend to underestimate that there is an element of luck. I am not saying you spend your whole life waiting for Madam Luck to come your way. But uh, a lot of things happen, and I have alluded to some of them in the books as well, which just happened. And you are mentally prepared because you were aware. Typically, if you are good, then you tend to be a bit boastful. And that can really get people. Right? You are close. You have to the plug, but we having tea afterwards, so if you have a chance to interact with Mr. Gopal as we form it. We would like to give a small memento. In addition to the usual memento, I have given the book Exploring Globalization. <laughs> but yes, you guys know I have a small part in that, so I thought I would give it to him. Thank you. After reading the book,